So this afternoon, I'm going to take up a new topic, which is International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. Uh, and uh, this is a very important uh, topic uh, because uh, of the fact that we have al already learned that how international military tribunal that was created uh, after the Second World War. So after that Second World War, uh, the criticisms were that uh, the international uh, military tribunal was the victor's tribunal. And uh, it was not uh, meeting out justice, which is which can be called a semblance of a fair justice. So therefore, uh, uh, what happened that I told you that uh, this uh, tribunal did not set a very good example. Uh, and uh, thereafter, I told you that uh, although it was not that in the whole world, no atrocities took place during the whole era of uh, uh, the Cold War, because I told you last time that in the 50s itself, Cold War started. So after that, it was very difficult for the United Nations Security Council to function properly because the whole world was divided into two main blocks. Uh, and uh, in one of the block uh, was US and other block was USSR, all of you might be knowing. Uh, but in the late 80s, what happened that uh, one of the block uh, that was the socialist block that was starting to collapse. Uh, might be because of uh, uh, the economic model or maybe some other factors uh, but uh, this uh, that model started to collapse and the uh, heat was felt in the former Yugoslavia uh, uh, and uh, what happened that in the former Yugoslavia because we have to say we have to understand first uh, that uh, what was the former Yugoslavia and if I, I'll show you the map. I'm just going to, these all countries were there, Slovenia, uh, and then this was Croatia. And uh, this one was Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, this one uh, was Montenegro and Macedonia, and then Serbia. And you might have heard about Kosovo, all these countries, uh, which were earlier, now they, they are all countries, but earlier before 1991, these all were uh, united together in the form of federation. So this was called the Socialist uh, Federation, this map. So uh, in this map, you'll find that the main ethnic communities were uh, Croats and uh, here there were Serbs and uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, Muslims were there and uh, also it was mixed but uh, majority was muslims in serbia majority uh, people were uh, serbs and uh, this was was Vodina that was uh, having kind of uh, autonomous status uh, at the time of sfry that was former socialist republic of yugoslavia and uh, this was slovenia where uh, slovenes were there and uh, this was and this was and this one, this one, what is that? This one, this one is Macedonia. So Macedonia was having again population of Muslims as well as Christians. So in Serbia, Serbs, Serbs were also Christians, but uh, they were uh, Orthodox Christians, and uh, Croats were also Christians, but they were uh, Catholics. So there were different types of, you see, even in one religion, uh, sometimes. Uh, there are different uh, types of uh, people uh, who follow a little bit of different practices and still uh, when there are differences they start fighting uh, for supremacy so this was what happened when yugoslavia was run by a very uh, famous uh, uh, ruler whose name was marshal tito marshal tito was also having friendship with uh, india uh, pandit nehru was a friend of marshal tito and uh, uh, what happened that uh, un until Marshal Tito was there at the helm of uh, the former Yugoslavia, uh, then the situation was still under control. Uh, and uh, all of you might be knowing that Tito, Nehru and Nasir, they had started this non-aligned movement. So uh, Yugoslavia was not aligned with either, these two, either of these two blocks. 
that was ussr and uh, uh, us but uh, the moment uh, uh, this uh, the control of uh, uh, marshal tito uh, was weak because he died thereafter all these you know main ethnic communities and ethno religious communities they started fighting for their supremacy over each other and they wanted to secede from the former yugoslavia so yugoslavian breakup started and uh, thereafter what happened that people came on the streets and they started uh, a conflict amongst each other and uh, then uh, uh, what happened that if you look at this slide uh, uh, the, this former yugoslavia was having and these kind of main locations and you see these locations were like slovenia croatia uh, bosnia and herzegovina serbia montenegro kosovo uh, so these were some of the main uh, location of conflicts and uh, in 1991 uh, only for 10 days a war was started and that was initiated uh, by yugoslav people's army uh so this was the name of the army of armed forces of yugoslavia jna and that started in 1991 june and uh, uh that started after the secession of slovenia uh, i have shown you slovenia from the federation uh and thereafter again another war of independence started that was the war of croatian war of independence uh so croatia also started uh, for that demand that no we will be free from the republic of uh, uh, the federation of yugoslavia so this was the kind of you know uh, ethnic conflict which started just after 1991 and uh, it was a kind of uh, politics which was started uh, where uh, the serbs were uh, going to take control over the the future whole di dynamics of the political system and uh, what happened that slobodan milosevic uh, you might have heard about his name he was the serb leader and he had become very famous and it was, he was very popular and he became the president of the republic of serbia and uh, he gradually started to control the whole army uh, of uh, not only serbia but uh, but also the federal republic of yugoslavia but at the same time he followed a policy which was uh, uh, very very bad which was uh, ethnic cleansing of bosnian muslims and albanians and uh, therefore uh, later he was indicted by international criminal tribunal for yugoslavia and he ultimately died in prison of heart attack uh, so uh, you see that people uh, who were having power uh, you see who were having their uh, control over the whole army armed forces people who were having control over the opinion uh, during those times you know they started such policies uh, during those times uh, uh that it became very difficult for the whole world to look look at it and just be mute and doing nothing so uh the world was also looking at the srebrenica uh, uh genocide which occurred in 1995 uh when the forces of one of the small republic which was also again declared uh, unilaterally republika srpska uh, that invaded the town of srebrenica uh, in eastern bosnia and herzegovina and in a few days what happened that more than 8000 bosnian muslim boys and girls were sent to detention centers abused tortured and executed and then most uh, heinous uh, crime that they committed was that women were also used as a means of war and uh, therefore they were also you know captured and uh, many times they were raped uh, so all these things uh, made the whole world uh, you know Uh, shocked and that how you know the things are turning out in the former yugoslavia and you see that how many people died you know mil million more than a million people died and uh, uh, and uh, you see that uh, many people many people uh, were displaced and this this continued up to 2001 uh, so uh, you see that uh, uh this one united nations did not stop uh, uh to act because at that moment of time united nations became active uh as uh, the old cold war came to an end and uh, security council uh, started to uh, assert itself 
and what happened at security council for the first time uh, you know established uh, united nations commission of experts uh, to look into the matters of uh, into the violations what were the violations of international humanitarian law and of the geneva conventions and uh, this uh, commission was later on uh, chaired by a very famous professor of uh, international criminal law who had who had shown the whole uh, scholarship uh, of international criminal law his name is professor sheriff bassioni and he is from united states he is still living uh, and uh, in 1992 uh, this uh, security council resolution was passed and again in 1993 what happened that uh, after this report was uh, submitted and even during that you know going on experts were doing their things uh, examining the things and doc looking at so many hu voluminous documents uh, in the meantime united nations security council adopted a resolution that is 808 of 1993 and uh, and uh, uh, thereafter what happened that it decided to establish ad hoc tribunal for the prosecution of serious violations of international humanitarian law uh, and uh, later it adopted the statute of international criminal tribunal for yugoslavia uh, after uh, the then un secretary general butras butras ghali he had uh, he had come up with the statute so this if you look at this statute the statute was also finally approved and uh, uh, this statute was this statute if you look at this statute uh, this statute was having around 34 articles and uh, if you look at this statute uh, these are some of the provisions like this was the competence of international tribunal and article 1 says that this tribunal will have the power to prosecute persons responsible for serious violations of international humanitarian law committed in the territory of the former yugoslavia since 1991 in accordance with the provisions of the present statute and then if you look at article 2 it deals with uh, what were what would be the matters which would be under the jurisdiction of icty and the first was grave breaches of geneva conventions of 1949 and uh, we have already uh, discussed uh, grave breaches uh, in the geneva conventions so this was some some of you uh, you were asking that uh, how uh, the geneva convention provisions and the hague convention provisions are enforced now look at all these provisions uh, that how these things are enforced look at article 2 of icty uh, which is grave breaches of geneva conventions of 1949 i had told you that in every geneva convention there is a provision of grave breaches do you see that these are the grave breaches uh, if uh, these kind of willful killing uh, torture uh, and then likewise these things are done prisoner of war suppose if somebody kills a prisoner of war and then taking civilians as hostages these are all grave breaches article 2 was uh, containing this grave breaches provisions article 3 contained violations of the laws of war or customs of war this topic also we have covered uh, we have seen that employment of poisonous weapons uh, or weapons which are calculated to cause unnecessary suffering uh, so these are all uh, prohibited under the uh, hague hague rules and now in additional protocol 1 uh, i have also discussed this uh, wanton destruction of cities towns or villages or such devastation which is not justified by military necessity these are all uh, prohibited under the hague rules and uh, under additional protocol 1 and likewise you see all these things we have discussed these are all uh, violations of the laws or customs of war the next provision which is uh, new in statute of icty was the provision on genocide uh, although genocide had occurred during the second world war also but the term genocide was not uh, very clear uh, uh, till the second world war so people had started to discuss about uh, you know such kind of killings where uh, people are uh, some group of some targeted persons are killed uh, but then they were not very sure but then in 1944 around 1944 45 uh, one scholar in germany he had given this term raffel lemkin 
so uh, now we will see that this for the first time genocide uh, was contained in the statute of ICTY. And if you look at genocide, this is defined, uh, although it was for, for the first time defined in 1948 Geneva Convention itself, but to enforce uh, the, Geneva, uh, uh, the genocide convention, uh, this uh, provision came in uh, this I ICTY statute. And if you look at it, genocide means any of the following acts committed with intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnical, racial or religious group as such. And then, then you kill members. So you target, first of all, any of these uh, groups and then you kill or cause serious bodily injury or mental harm to members of the group. Likewise, so imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group and uh, if you forcibly transfer children of the group to another group. So these will be called genocide. Then uh, there is also provision on crimes against humanity. I am not going to deal with crimes against humanity right now. I will deal with it, uh, this uh, topic when I will study. I will, I will take you to uh, International Criminal Court. And then uh, Article 6 and 7 uh, is continuing the tradition which was laid down in the IMT at Nuremberg and IMT, IMTFE at uh, Tokyo, where these kind of tribunals have jurisdiction over individuals. And then Article 7 also says that individuals will be criminally responsible if individual had planned uh, any uh, crime which is coming under the present statute. And it also again makes clear that the official position of any accused person, uh, whether as head of a state or government or as a responsible government official, shall not relieve such person of uh, criminal responsibility, uh, uh, nor mitigate, nor mitigate any kind of uh, liability. So, Article Seven is uh, very important. Uh, you see that all these uh, individual criminal responsibility rule. Uh, that is also laid down. And the third important thing that uh, we must understand that the jurisdiction of ICTY was uh, starting uh, from 1st of January 1991 because this was the time when ethnic conflicts in Yugoslavia had started to take place at a large scale. So uh, these are some of the provisions uh, which uh, I thought that you must uh, um, you must uh, know about it. and. Uh, and uh, you should uh, look at it. Uh, so now I will uh, uh, take you to some of the other provisions like in the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia, uh, there is a chamber system. So unlike I, when we were discussing this uh, IMT and IMTFE, I had told you that uh, there was no system of appeal there. So whatever was decided by the, uh, the military tribunal uh, in the first instance, that was final. Uh, there was just an appeal uh, before the political authority. But uh, uh, as we all know that this is one of the principles of uh, a legal system, good legal system, that there must be also appeal at body so, so that if there is kind of any kind of uh, error which is uh, committed at the lower level, that can be rectified. So uh, this time when ICTY is established, uh, trial chamber was there and from the decision of the trial chamber, uh, the judgment uh, if uh, a person is not satisfied with the judgment of uh, trial chamber, then and the appeal can be also preferred and that appeal will be going to the appeal chamber where there will be seven judges. Apart from uh, the uh, bench, uh, there will be also the bar and uh, the bar will be uh, coming from uh, any country but they must be registered they must be registered in the court of ICTY. Uh, uh, and then there is a prosecutor and there, then there will be registry. As far as the appointment of uh, the prosecutor and the judges, uh, those were concerned, United Nations Security Council uh, was having an important role. Uh, although it was started by the, uh, by the Secretary General of United Nations, but ultimately, uh, final decision would be taken by the Security Council members. Uh, so, uh, Security Council, and you might sometimes ask that why you have United Nations Security Council took uh, this action to establish this ICTY, because as you all know that uh, United Nations has been given the primary responsibility to maintain international peace and security. 
and uh, if there is a threat to peace or if there is breach of uh, international peace and security or if there is a threat of aggression or breach of uh, uh, this uh, obligation of aggression obligation not to commit aggression then a uh, security council may take a decision to uh, uh, to uh, so, uh, to do something uh, maybe that it may it may use force or it may act under chapter 7 of the united nations charter so this icty was established under chapter 7 of the united nations charter because that chapter uh, it has given the uh, power to the united nations security council to look at uh, any kind of breaches of international peace and security and because this was a, a grave breach to international uh, peace and security therefore what happened that uh, this was uh, created so this was a new exper experiment and that experiment was made uh, at the level of united nations security council now i will uh, take you to some of the uh, famous uh, uh, judgments uh, which were uh, made, uh, delivered by this ICTY, which started functioning from uh, 1994. And uh, the first very landmark judgment which, uh, which came, uh, that, was, that was the Tadic, Tadic judgment, right? And I will just uh, show you uh, one of the video uh, where, uh, where the Tadic where this Tadic was, where this Tadic was brought before the ICTY, and uh, and uh, this uh, uh, this so I look at this one, and if you, you can you can see this, you see that this was. I don't think that will be enough, Mr. President. Um, how much time do you think that you would need, Mr. Vladimir? Yes, well, I think two weeks, two weeks more will be convenient for the defense. Two weeks in addition to the uh, That's right. 14 days? Yeah. So that would then get us to about... June eighteenth, I suppose. That's right. That's a Sunday. Sunday, well. Uh, I will run it. Actually, I was thinking about pushing it back the other way, only because I haven't seen the motion, and neither have you. No. So you don't really know whether you'd need but a month. Uh, there is some difference between the prosecution and the defense. That is that we have not yet had a disclosure of the file, so we cannot judge the context of it. For that reason, I think you need some more time. Suppose we said, gave you two weeks initially, let you look at the motion, and then if you need an additional two weeks, then of course we'd be Well, happy. that's a good idea. Yes. Okay. We can agree with that. Okay. Then you would respond to so the motion, is, is we'll say, by the Monday, which would be June 5th. Actually, that's a little bit more than, no? <laughs> Well, that will be fine. No, 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 wait a minute now. This is, no, wait, that's even too much time. Excuse me. This is April 26th. Let's count the days. You see what I have here? I have these colors, and I don't know that I fully understand them. Let me see. Well, I understand there's some problem in time. Why don't we give you until Friday, May the 12th, to file your response? At and least to file a response with respect to the date. Well, file, attempt to file a response to the motion that the government, that the prosecutor indicates that it's filing. Now, if you do not need, if you do not have enough time, that is, if after you receive the motion, you consider that you are unable to respond to it in that approximate two-week period, then simply file a request for leave for an additional two weeks. It may be that when you receive their motion that you'll find that you can easily respond to it. Yes, I do agree okay. that, but we have to share that. Right? Okay, so okay. you may have then until May the 12th, and I 
with the understanding that if after you receive the motion you need additional time, then you will advise the court prior to that time. And uh, we will. Uh, so this was uh, uh, this was the video of uh, just called Tadic, and Tadic was brought before International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. Uh, and you uh, watched that Tadic was sitting in the dock and that uh, one uh, side was the prosecution and the other side was uh, defense team. And uh, so they were asking for the time uh, when the matter would be heard in detail. Uh, so you see that uh, uh, the judgment of in Tadic case uh, that that came uh, uh, finally in 1999 uh, by the appeals chamber was uh, it took time uh, the first uh, judge order came uh, from the trial uh, chamber in 1995 and then finally it took uh, so he went in appeal and finally appeals chamber so you see that who was Tadic. Tadic was a person who had control over uh, the, the paramilitary forces in Serbia. So you see that uh, uh, what happened that Serb forces had attacked Bosnian Muslims and Croat population centers in a municipality, uh, Piedor, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And uh, what he did that he had confined uh, those Bosnian Muslims and Croat uh, people in the refugee camps. And what happened that Tadic actively participated and he was accused of murder of two Muslim policemen. And he had killed civilians in villages, removed men from villages to undisclosed camps. And uh, what he did that uh, ordered detainee to bite off the testicles of another detainee. And uh, also, he was, uh, he had done many other things. Uh, so you see that he was a politician, he was a Serb politician, and he was an unofficial member of Bosnian Serb forces. And uh, you see that what were the heinous uh, acts that he was doing. And uh, the matter was, uh, you know, brought before ICTY. He had been indicted and ultimately was uh, arrested and then was facing trial. And finally in the appeals chamber, you see, that he was found guilty of the commission of war crimes, crimes against humanity and grave breaches of Genoa Convention, and also sexual violence, which amounted to uh, cruel treatment or war crime. And finally, he was sentenced to 20 years of imprisonment. So this is one of the landmark judgment. Justice, uh, at that moment of time, uh, Justice uh, Shahabuddin uh, was there, he was presiding. Uh, in the appeal chamber and he had given this judgment. So uh, I will uh, request all of you to look at these uh, uh, judgments and orders of, and then I will move on to the next uh, uh, slide, which is again a prominent trial. And this prominent trial was of uh, uh, Karadzic, Radovan Karadzic. You might have heard about his name. Uh, his uh, case was heard by the appeal chamber and he was a doctor by a professor, he was a psychiatrist, and he had founded uh, the Serb Democratic Party. See, and uh, he was the first president of uh, the self declared republic, which was called Republika Srpska. And uh, then, uh, what he had done that he was allegedly a main perpetrator in Srebrenica massacre of 1995. And uh, uh, the, the charge was that he had persecuted Bosnian Muslims and Bosnian Croats uh, by sniping and shelling of one place of Bosnia, Sarajevo, to spread terror. And he had taken hostage of 200 United Nations peacekeepers and military observers to compel the NATO to abstain from air strikes. So this case was also you know, very lengthy because he was a very powerful person. Uh, you see all these persons like, like he was the president of this republic. You see this kind of powerful person, what they were doing. And uh, therefore it was, uh, you know, it was very difficult for any national machinery to, to uh, give, and give, them, uh, give them any kind of, you know, trial and then punishment. And therefore international criminal tribunal that did a great deal and finally held that 
uh, this person Rajik was guilty of grave breaches of Geneva Convention, war crimes, genocide, and crimes against humanity, and he was sentenced to death. Also, I will uh, advise you to look at uh, this person, uh, this trial. This was uh, the trial of Perlik and some other people. Uh, what happened that uh, the tension between Croats and Muslims that was already there in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And in the municipality of uh, Projor, uh, Prelik, what, Prelik, who was Prelik? Prelik was the Prime Minister of Croatia, Croatian One Council, which was very powerful. Croatian Defense Council. So he was the Prime Minister of that. And uh, he had ordered to attack that municipality, Prozor. And uh, what happened that he had destroyed many Muslim homes and vehicles in the town, burned down houses, killed people. And then you see that this killing went on, fighting uh, went on. And finally, what happened that many people, many Muslim men of military age, women, children, and elderly persons they were arrested and they were uh, tortured. Um, mosques were also destroyed and humanitarian aid was cut off and women were raped. Uh, so finally what happened that Perlik and others, uh, although they had evaded arrest from the ICTY for a long time, but finally they were arrested and uh, ultimately the ICTY held that Perlik and others were guilty of grave breaches of Geneva Conventions, violations of laws and customs of war, and crimes against humanity. So uh, what I was trying to tell you that uh, ICTY was able to uh, do uh, the administration of criminal justice, international criminal law, uh, uh, with a great deal of strength, because it needed strength to, to try these kind of mighty people uh, of, uh, of, a party, of some countries, you see, and they were all in uh, the detention of ICTY. Uh, so what I will tell you that if you look at the contribution of ICTY, ICTY was the first ever tribunal which was established under Chapter 7 of the United Nations Charter. And uh, uh, as a huge uh, uh, evolution or you may say development, and there was also not only a kind of, you know, prosecution department, but there was a victim program and witnesses program here. Uh, and then there were some attorneys which were there to provide legal aid uh, to those uh, defendants who were not having the means to de defend themselves. Uh, and you see there is a figure that 90 uh, defendants received full legal aid and 50 received partial legal aid. So it was a huge uh, upgradation uh, in the character of any tribunal. Uh, and if you look at uh, the um, other contributions of sexual violence in wartime, and there were some cases, I, because of paucity of time, only uh, three minutes are left. Because of paucity of time, what I will say that you should look at these cases. Because in these cases, sexual violence for the first time was also dealt with uh, by uh, ICTY. And then uh, this was the tribunal which has also decided on the elements of genocide. And then it was also doing uh, some, uh, it was also giving some orders on uh, enslavement and persecution. So finally, uh, what I will tell you that uh, there were these many indictments issued, uh, more than 150 indictments issued, and uh, many people were sentenced to in jail and 19 also acquitted. Uh, so it was not that all the persons were uh, sentenced uh, in prison. Uh, so 19 acquitted and there was no uh, uh, capital punishment uh, this time. So this was also very important. Finally, what I will tell you, uh, that uh, if you, if somebody will ask you that what is the criticism of ICTY? Uh, yes, again, this was a tribunal which was having primacy over the national courts. And uh, if uh, somebody will ask you that uh, what was the role of Security Council, then Security Council was having a very important role. Uh, it could decide about uh, the, uh, the judges and prosecutors. And lastly, you see that uh, many people say that, that the role of NATO that was not, be, not, not examined by uh, by ICTY and finally it could not try all the perpetrators perpetrators of crime and during Balkan Wars. If you have to study uh, something more about this topic you can study my article that was published in the ISI yearbook of uh, International Humanitarian and Refugee Law 2008 and if you want to study something more 
Then you may also study my book on international criminal law that has been published in 2020. Uh, this is international criminal law uh, theory and practice. And uh, lastly, there is a regional commission work which is going on there in former Yugoslavia. We can also study about it. Yeah. So I hope uh, a little bit of understanding you might have got uh, in attend by attending this class.